Okay, so here's what I want you to do with the passage I just gave you. All I want you to do right now is go through the passage and try to make a determination as to what kind of animal is described, right? What is the creature that the author is talking about? And muster evidence, right, for your answer. Can we write on this? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I don't need those back. Now, if you have seen this passage before and you already know what the answer is, keep that to yourself. But yeah, I'm just looking for you to figure out what the creature is. Yes. I'm not giving this back to you. No, you're not giving it back to me. Yeah, you can you can scribble on it, highlight it, whatever you want to do.
promise you that this is talking about a real animal. This is not a made-up creature. Keep you know, thinking about it as long as you need to. Right? The name of the game here is slow, steady, careful reflection, not you know, reaching for quick answers. Uh, but when you think you have an answer, right? when you think you know what the creature is and can prove what it is, speak up. Yeah, Myla. Okay, right. You, you, you mean like that type of monkey, not that specific yes, monkey? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so, so you, think, you think it's a baboon? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah, baboons don't have tails. thoughts. And again, like, you know, just take your time with this. If you don't have something right away, keep at it. That's okay. But okay, we got one idea up here. Having to do with the colors, I was thinking like orangutan. Okay, an orangutan. So most of you are thinking something in the ape family.
keep mulling it over. What's an antipathy? Antipathy? Mm -hmm. um, antipathy is a strong dislike. might these creatures be? Dugs is a word for breasts, okay. usually referred to only in relation to animals. Gotcha. Pardon? <laughs> Must be extremely uncomfortable. <laughs> Keep thinking about it, keep thinking of other possibilities. Okay. Let me ask you this before we sort of go further with, with the ape thing. Is there enough information to narrow it down to any specific type of ape? Why would you say no, Chris? I don't know. These details are... I mean, they're specific, but I can't uh -huh. narrow them down in any type of way. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. To piggyback off what he said, it starts off, it says, uh, last time he held several animals. And okay. And towards the bottom of the passage, it says, uh, hair of both sexes was of several colors. So we got brown, red, black, and yellow. Uh-huh. Which you know, kind of goes with what we've got so far. Uh-huh. Typically, yeah, like gray, like sort of like dark gray or blackish fur, yeah. Well, That's the that that throwing me off is the colors. The several colors, okay. Yellow. So, I mean, a lot of the other characteristics, like they're a wide range of characteristics, like they go with a lot of different types of like mm -hmm. monkey related animals. Okay. Can we think of a specific monkey-related animal that has, say, variable hair colors? Gray for bad room, I think. Dark, brown, and black for shifts. I think orange Just something that doesn't. I feel like I want you to think it's a monkey and it's not really a monkey. Yeah, you, you, you've, you've got that right. It's, it's, not, it's not a monkey. It's not an ape. Pardon? No. <laughs> but I, 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 I will tell you that you are already, you are already very familiar with it. What's that? A pregnant dog. Yes. Remember, yeah, the do right dogs can't. If the dogs are sitting in trees, right, dogs can't climb, and they, and they don't tails. fly, and dogs have tails. Yeah. Yeah, Myla. Pardon? It is not a hyena. <laughs> you let, let me just say, you, you, you guys are on more or less the right track, thinking ape-like. Yeah, Heather. Do meerkats have tails? Oh my gosh. Yes. Oh, it's not a meerkat. Um, yeah, meerkat, yeah, meerkats I believe do have tails. And also meerkats tend to be just, tend to all be the same color, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess. I just thought about the, like, 
Mm -hmm. I can't think of yellow like Well, the hair, right, the hair of both sexes was several colors, brown, red, black, and yellow. Yeah, Mary. Yes. Yes. The, no way. <laughs> the creature described here is a human being. He's talking about human beings in a degraded, barbaric state, right? Human beings, that, like these creatures, he refers to them. He doesn't call them people. He calls them yahoos. And initially, the narrator does not recognize his own kinship with these creatures. He just sees these disgusting beasts running around naked in a field, digging up food and sitting in trees. So, yeah, the, the passage is designed to throw you off, right? The passage designed to make you think he's talking about some kind of ape-like creature. But the only animal that actually fits all of the characteristics he describes, or can fit all of the characteristics he describes, is a human being. So what I want you to try to think about now that we know what the creature is, go back to it and try to come up with some claim, like look for patterns, right? Look for strands that sort of patterns of repetition, right? Now by repetition, I don't mean repetition of exact words or, or uh, images. But repetition of, like, look for things that seem to be related to each other, right? That seem to be part of the same kind of pattern. Like, you know, words that are related to animals, or words that are related to motion, um, or words that are related to feeling, right? And look as well, right, for binaries, look for paired opposites. And try to identify a strand or a binary that you think is particularly important for telling us how the narrator wants us to feel about this creature, what he wants us um, to think of this creature.
once again, you know, I'm not, you know, not trying to rush this, not trying to speed you along, but when you feel like you have something, when you have a set of evidence you can make a claim about, feel free to speak up. Okay, Joe. Uh, as far as the binaries go, mm -hmm. um, I got here, uh, we had, they had beards like goats. Okay. Uh, so I'm assuming he's talking about men, facial hair, whereas conversely he talks about uh, the females had long length of hair with heads but not on their faces. Okay. So hairy face versus smooth face. which is related to a male-female binary, right? Do the differences between the male and female creatures appear to him to be more than surface level? Do they appear to be more than um, simply on the basis of, uh, like on the basis of appearance? Okay, so it seems to be, yeah. Surface level, but yeah, the women don't, do the, the female creatures you described seem to behave any differently from the male creatures. So what does this suggest that if, if the male and female creatures don't behave any differently from each other, then what does this suggest about the, spe yeah, um, the kind of describing he's doing here? If he's only categorizing by appearance. Okay, yeah, he's right, he's generalizing, right? Right. This is what all members of the species are like. This is how we break them down by appearance. Um, what sort of tone is he taking here in making these generalizations about these creatures? What is he sound what is he trying to sound like? He's a puzzle. Okay. He's different from them. Right? These creatures are not like me, right? He's different. He's taking the tone of, yeah, like, could we say like a, a detached observer? Yes. Right, he sounds almost like a zoologist, right? Just describing these weird animals in the field. So, we can sort of put that aside as something we can maybe work into a claim, right? Like, why? The detached tone, right? Why is he talking like a scientist about these creatures? And we can come back to that. Anybody have another sort of pattern or binary that they see? Yeah, Myla. Okay. He talks a lot about hair. Yeah. Can we give? Can you uh, point to me the the places where he's talking about their hair? Okay. He says some have big hair, some have frizzle. Okay. He says they have they don't have a lot of fur on their body, but they have down on the rest of it. Uh huh. Except on their anus and then. Uh huh. He says a long with the hair down their backs. Yep. And their legs. Uh-huh. Okay. We can look down. They have long, long hang hair in their heads, but none in their faces. Nor anything more than a sort of down on the rest of their bodies, except about the anus and pedenda. The hair of both sexes was of several colors, brown, red, black, and yellow. So do we notice any particular pattern in the way hair is talked about? Here, we, he's a lot of references to hair. Okay, yeah, long. He's talked a lot about where it is and where it's not. Yeah, location of hair is very important here. This is where these creatures are hairy. This is where they are not hairy. Now, this is also sort of part of our guidepost as to what creature we're talking about, right? Human beings, slightly hairier than normal human beings, right, who don't um, 
say, you know, prune or shave or laser off their body hair in any way will have similar characteristics, right? So yeah, the location of the hair is supposed to be a hint as to what kind of creature this is. Why do you think he spends so much time on where the hair is located in giving us hints about what this creature is? Yeah, I mean, this is one of the things that differentiates a human being from other mammals, right? Considerably less hairy. But why does it matter? And, you know, again, this is just, you know, something to think through for a minute while we then sort of look at other patterns. Um, why does it matter that the only thing to him that seems to distinguish say a human being from a orangutan from a orangutan is the amount of the amount and location of hair on the body right because we noted otherwise these creatures are described as being basically apes yeah so why use hair as the indicator for what sort of creature this is and you know don't have to answer that yet we'll think on it other strands, binaries that you guys notice. He talks about their uh, posture. Okay, posture. So, give me, give me an example. Uh, he talks about it, so he says uh, uh, they sat on the ground. Uh huh. Um, they're known to lie down, uh, but they often stood on their hind feet. Okay. So, right. Capable of walking erect. Right. Yeah. They sit on the ground. They're capable of standing up. They sit in trees. All right. To what extent does the posture seem to, does the posture seem um, quite as prevalent or quite as important as some of these other, like the hairiness characteristic? What were you gonna, what were you gonna say, Chris? You had a hand up a second ago. Oh, I was gonna talk about the part where he says their shape was very singular and deformed. Cause okay. Because when I'm thinking about when he says the word shape, it seems structured, but at the end of the sentence he says deformed. At the yeah. Same time. That's a, yeah. That's 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 a really good catch there. Yeah, shaped and deformed. Right. What does the word shaped suggest? Like a basic layout or structure, like some sort of symmetry. Yeah. Like, almost like crafted, right? Like someone arranged this creature or this object in this particular way. This object was shaped from a specific mold or a specific model, yeah? And deformed suggests what? Warped. Yeah, that, yeah, that it's, it, yeah it, it's fallen away from some kind of ideal, right? It's fallen away. From the model, so we have you know sort of the ideal paired up against something broken or flawed, right? So whatever mold these creatures were cast from, whatever ideal they're supposed to they're supposed to, to match in their actual physical form, they don't live up to it. So we could probably then, knowing what we do about these creatures, we could probably then make a claim about the author's attitude towards humanity, right? What he's trying to suggest about people here, especially if we pair this up with the last sentence, right? Upon the whole, I never beheld in all my travels so disagreeable an animal, or one against which I naturally conceived so strong an antipathy. Right. He looks on these creatures, right, and he hates them. He thinks they're disgusting. So, what does this have to do with the idea of being shaped or deformed? So what the narrator doesn't recognize his own kinship with these creatures. How would he view himself in relation to them, do you think? 
especially given what we talked about over here before about the detached observer kind of tone. He definitely doesn't see himself as one of them. Yeah, he doesn't see himself as part of this group, right? He doesn't recognize himself in them. Yet, later in this novel, he comes face to face with one and recognizes what it is. But yeah, he does not at this point recognize himself in these creatures and seems to regard himself as superior to them, right? So he sort of places himself in the realm of the ideal, the, the ideal compared to me, right? These creatures are flawed, deformed, right? They, they've fallen short, right? They don't build cities and ships, they don't wear pants, um, they run around digging in the dirt. Does he have, like, does this person not have hair since hair is so much of like a big thing? Well, you know, he, you would imagine he does, right? Yeah. In the same places that these creatures do. But <clears throat> all he seems to notice, right, is their difference from him. Or he seems to regard even their similarities to him as difference, right? He reads these creatures solely as opposite, other, different. And his refusal to identify with them shows that he refuses to accept what about human beings or about human nature. Okay, that he, right, he refuses to acknowledge kinship with other people, right? But there's something specific about these other people that bothers him. Does he feel like they shouldn't exist? Like they're not natural to the natural world? Like a feral human? Yeah, yeah, they're, yeah they're, they're like like a feral person, right? So he, you know, to the, they're different enough that he doesn't recognize them as human. So is he, is he in a different country? Yes. And remember the terms in which these creatures are described. Why was it so hard for you to figure out that he was talking about a human being? Pardon? So you say they were in a field. Okay, well, human beings hang out in fields, right? Now and again. In a tree? In a tree. Yeah, they can sit in a tree. It indicates they can climb. He didn't give any like, concrete or specific details that you would typically associate with. Right. He didn't give us concrete details we would usually associate with a human. He gave us concrete details we would usually ascri ascribe to animals. to a non-human animal. Yes. Specifically said that their skins were um, brown, above color. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and whereas where you know the the, the narrator in this case um, would be. Um, would be a white dude. Um, <clears throat> the particular passage to this particular passage to give you some contexts uh, comes from a novel by Jonathan Swift called *Gulliver's Travels*, which describes the experiences of a naive ship's doctor um, in the early 18th century as he continually signs up on voyages and keeps getting marooned or shipwrecked um, in weird places. One would think that this would encourage this guy to just stop getting on boats. Um, but he's constantly signing on for new voyages. And this is the, from the final voyage that he undertakes, right? He washes up on this island where the civilized creatures, the intelligent creatures, are horses. And the barbaric creatures are human beings. So he seems to be making, one could, like based on sort of what we've pulled out of this, right? One could make the argument that what's being pointed out in this passage is sort of the refusal of human beings to accept the animal side of our natures, right? A refusal to embrace the animal side of humanity. That we are not so different from other creatures as we like to think we are. <laughs> that given different circumstances, in fact, we would be unrecognizable to other humans. 
So in idealizing humanity and thinking that there is any kind of ideal human form or ideal of human behavior, we're fooling ourselves because we're always going to end up falling short. So <clears throat> we largely came to these conclusions right without much discussion of context, right? We could get this just from reading this particular paragraph. Right? It takes some doing, right? It's slow, and we have to talk through it, we have to work through it. But just from this particular paragraph, like knowing nothing else about the novel, we can still, you know, we can still come up with a reading of it, right? With a, with an interpretation. Now, one thing about interpretation generally, really two things. First, any interpretation must be based on the available evidence. If there is not enough evidence to support a particular interpretation, that interpretation is not valid, right? This is one of the reasons when we talked, uh, you know, when we were uh, last time looking at that book cover, right? A few of you were saying, oh, well, the woman in the picture is his wife, right? Well, why did I keep saying, no, we don't know that? Exactly. There was nothing in the picture to prove that, right? There was nothing in the picture to prove the relationship. There are certain kinds of relationship that are suggested by the picture, but there was nothing strong enough to say this is a this is a man and his wife, right? So, interpretations must always be rooted in the available evidence. They must always be supported by the available evidence. By the available evidence, your interpretation. must also be plausible. There are going to be many different ways to interpret the same set of evidence, right? We're not always going to agree on what a particular thing we're looking at means or the possible range of meanings that something we're looking at can have. But you have to interpret things in ways that other people can understand and might share, right? In other words, like you can't just make shit up. You have to be able to convince, it has to be something you could actually uh, convince another person of if they're looking at the same pattern of evidence you are, right? Well, let me show you my pattern of evidence. This is what I drew from it. This is what it's rooted in, right? So these two concepts really are very much related to each other. Um, has to be rooted in concrete details, has to be rooted in the evidence before you, and it has to be something that another person might reasonably believe. Okay, so what I want you to do now, I'm going to write two words on the board, and I want you to pretend that you have never seen these words before, and I want you to pretend that you know nothing about the context in which we usually use these words. So if we completely ignore the usual context in which these words appear, what do they mean? Pro-life. Okay, yeah. What, 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 what would they, okay, what would pro-life mean? If you just broke it down to a literal definition. Yeah, I'm in favor of life, right? In favor of life, living, 
being alive, right? All that good stuff, right? And if you completely divorce it, again, from its usual context in American political discourse, what does pro-choice mean? Choice. Yeah, in favor of choice, in favor of options, right? In favor of being select, being able to select outcomes. Now, when we introduce context into this, then what do these words mean? Yeah. Um, if you're pro-life, you are against abortion rights, right? If you are pro-choice, you are in favor of abortion rights. So why do we not simply frame it that way? Why do we not simply say pro-abortion, anti-abortion? It's your choice of words. Nicer way of saying it. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. We're, we're saying it euphemistically, right? We, yeah, either one is a sugar coating of the actual position, right? Why not? Why would someone who regards himself as pro life not want to say that they're anti abortion? Why would they want to say they're pro life instead? It sounds more positive. Yes, exactly. It's better to be pro something, right? People think more positively of you if you are pro something than if you are anti something. Right? Anti something seems negative, anti something seems like a downer. Anti something seems like you you know you want to you just want to fight about it right. If you're pro something, hey, I'm in favor of this, and instead of being in favor of abortion, which is something that people don't usually like to talk about, right? I'm in favor of life, right? <laughs> Who wouldn't be in favor of life? Life is a good thing. Life is a nice thing. It's infinitely preferable to the alternative, as far as I know, never having experienced the alternative. Now, what about pro-choice. Why would you say you are pro-choice rather than you are that you are pro-abortion? Okay, yeah. Because again, it means you don't actually have to name the thing itself, right? Just, just like the word abortion itself just like yeah, <laughs> yeah it's just it resonates a, with so many people. Yeah, the the word has so many strong connotations, right? The word makes people feel so, you know, makes people feel negatively. Like, what this does is not remind people of the actual thing, right? And again, much like when you say you're pro life, right, you're saying, okay, I'm in favor of a thing, which you are anyway in this particular position, right? I'm in favor of something. And you're also in favor of something that people generally like and that is generally regarded as nice, right? Having choices. So we rhetorically frame this in ways that kind of dance around the actual argument, right? And if you don't have the proper context for understanding the way we use these phrases, you would have no freaking idea that they're regarded as opposite sides in a debate, right? Now what would make, what in particular would make it difficult to frame these as opposite sides in a debate if you didn't already know what they meant. They're both pro. They're both pro something, yeah. They're both pro. And they don't claim to be pro the same thing. Right? They claim to be pro different things. So context is vitally important here in determining meaning. Right? Without context, there's no clear relationship between these two phrases. So, <clears throat> in general, you are always going to have to think about not just the evidence in front of you, 
but the context of the larger piece in which it occurs, or even like sort of larger cultural debates in which they occur. Now, if we take, for example, styles of dress in this classroom, right? Let's take my style of dress, for example. We've already done a little bit of picking apart of this, right? Um, now, for a professor of English, am I dressed up or dressed down? Dressed down, right? Yeah, most of your professors probably dress a little bit more uh, shall we say carefully than I do? Maybe some of them don't. I don't know. I don't. I don't know who you. I don't know who you got classes with. Um, if I walk down the hall here, I know there's you know there's a new guy at the end of the hall who wears a full suit every day. And he, he must be dying. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, right. So yeah, for you know, given you know my professional status and level of education, right, I'm dressed down. Now, um, if I were say. At a Slayer concert, and I'm wearing this button-down shirt. Dressed up, dressed then I'm dressed up, right? And this is probably going to get torn off me at some point. Someone's going to punch me. Yeah, yeah, not, not a great, not a great idea, right? So whether I'm dressed up or dressed down is entirely dependent on situation and on context. Um, even when we talk about sort of like levels of authority, right? Ostensibly speaking. Who's the authority figure in this room supposed to be? Okay, so yeah. Here, in this context, I am, for all intents and purposes, in charge. Whatever that means. <laughs> now, if I have to go and have a meeting with my dean, different situation, different context, am I in charge there? Okay. Absolutely not, right? By and large, I have to do what he's, you know, I have to do more or less what he says. So even sort of those sorts of power relationships that we're generally involved in in our day-to-day -day lives, right? They vary from context to context. Let's go back for a minute to talking about that photo that I showed you last time, right? We got to we, we got a little bit to we got to talking about some of its context, right? In particular, we got to talking about um, the nature of the object itself, right? The fact that it's a book cover and is thus intended to make people pick the book up, leaf through it, want to buy it, right? That's one particular context in which to consider it. We also talked a little bit about <coughs> time period, right? The era in which it was published, right? This would be another context in which to consider, right? the, you know, the context of 1960s counterculture. Right, we have a, you know, a shaggy haired author with a mustache and sunglasses, um, you know, not dressing up like the man with a woman in sort of kind of hippie garb sitting at his feet, right? Right, that's kind of the major takeaway, the image, right? And we talked about last time as well about how the image is kind of triangulated, right? There are the three figures in it. You've got the statue of Ben Franklin. You've got the male author. standing in the foreground, but below the statue, right? And you've got unknown female sitting at the male author's feet and below the statue, right? At the bottom of the triangle. So if we think about the positioning of these figures, in the context of American history and what was going on in the 1960s, right? What do we know about, uh, particularly, let's say, like protest movements in the 60s? Okay, yeah, Viet right, Vietnam War. 
civil rights, and yeah, what we now call second wave feminism. So there are all these sort of social movements associated with not the mainstream culture, but the counterculture, right? Sort of pushing back against certain trends in post-war American mainstream culture. Now, why might it be important that there's a statue of Ben Franklin in the background? Yes, he embodies the man. The man. The man. <laughs> Well, well, let's let, let's let's think about what Benjamin Franklin would actually embody, right? What generation of Americans is Franklin part of? Yeah, the founding of the United States as a republic, right? The revolutionary generation. Right? He was you know, there for the signing of the Declaration of Independence. He was you know, one of the oldest delegates, right? And he's known as a sort of self-made printer, right? That was his professional goal, and you know, a man of various talents. So you have various talents, self-made and self-educated. and part of the Revolutionary War generation, right? Too old to fight, but one of the planners anyway, right? Involved in an intellectual sense and in a diplomatic sense. So what might Ben Franklin being in the background, hovering over the author, suggest about where the author sees himself in terms of traditional American values. What is, where does he think traditional American values really lie? Okay, perhaps in the past, right? And would they, for this guy, lie with the guys in the business suits living in the cookie cutter suburbs, taking the train into work every day and, when, no. He would argue, right, or seem to want to be associated with that earlier revolutionary attitude, right? So he would argue that he himself, perhaps like implicitly through the image, and the social movements that the 60s counterculture embodies are more truly American, more genuinely American, than the mainstream culture. Now, <clears throat> what's problematic about this interpretation? What have we still not dealt with? Yeah, the woman in the picture, right? We still haven't brought her into this reading. Now, the 60s is kind of ground zero for second wave feminism, right? But where is this woman positioned in the picture? The at the bottom, right? At a man's feet. Right at the base of the triangle that's formed by the three figures. She's not looking directly at the viewer like the man is. She's sitting very casually and comfortably, right? It's not on the one hand, like, you know, it, it's not a ladylike, you know, what you know, ladylike in the sort of capital L lady, so you know, sense position. So she is, at the very least, a little bit unconventional. But at the same time, she's still clearly just there as a as a prop, right? She's not part of the novel, she's not part of the process, she's just, you know, she's there in the picture, sitting at this guy's feet. So, one thing that this might tell us, right, one thing that we always want to look for 
when we come up with an interpretation of an image, of a text, of anything, is what in that image undermines our reading of it. Right, so while the author here seems to want to, be asso to associate progressive ideals with, you know, the founding of the republic and with sort of true American history, right? He is also still participating in a kind of traditional patriarchal tradition as well, right? So his progressivism only extends so far. It doesn't seem to extend to the woman who's sitting at his feet. And you don't have to agree with the way I've interpreted the image, right? There are other ways you can interpret this image. This is just one way that you can use a known historical context, right? To come up with a reading of just about anything. And you know, I would also, you know, I would also say that right, there are some things that we tend to regard as not worth thinking about, not worth interpreting, right? You know, why should I bother interpreting you know, the new Guardians of the Galaxy movie, right? It's just a big bang up, you know, shoot 'em up superhero movie. Um, there's no deep content there, right? Why am, I, you know, why am I just assigning meanings that aren't there to this? Um, the fact that something is only intended as entertainment or is only intended as something to wear, right? It doesn't mean that it doesn't still carry some sort of serious cultural weight, right? And we will be better thinkers and we'll be better citizens if we always think through the implications, if we always think through the possible meanings of everything we do, everything we wear, everything we watch, right? It also makes it much, much harder for people to bullshit us. And that includes people like me, right? So be careful out there. <laughs> All, right. All right, so for how many of you is this your last class before the Labor Day weekend begins? All right, that's everyone. So we got about 15 minutes. Um, I've pretty much said my piece here. No, I'll let no you work. What's that? No homework. Yeah, you, you don't have any homework tonight. No. <laughs> oh, there's, there's, plenty, there's plenty more coming. Oh, yeah, no, I have, I have no fear. I was just thinking you were going to hear the reflections. We're trying to.